Wait. Alien. Oh, you gotta let the beat drop. Yes, there we yeah. go. Yeah. I nice. knew you were gonna like that. <laughs> oh, All right, man. So, okay. ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the NGSC Draft Central podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Zimmer, and as always, joined with me, Mr. Montel Hardy. Montel, what's going on, my friend? I'm doing just fine, Josh. Uh, you know, really to get into the intro music. This is how we start the show, right? You know, a little logic. Uh, just a little quick thank you to everyone in Columbia, South Carolina, who made my stay incredible. Had a fantastic seven days down there. There are some, some good people out there, Josh. I suggest you, you know, maybe, maybe take a trip out south sometime. You know what? I might have to. You know, I might have to. I've always <laughs> the weather wanted is great, to. Bro. I've always wanted to. And now from everything that you've told me, I think I might have to. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to throw you guys a curveball. Joining us right now, Mr. Shane Alexander of A1G Football, is that correct? Want to make yeah, sure I got, you got it. Hey, perfect. I want to make sure I got that right. I uh, can't, can't ruin the brand. But, again, Shane, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, real quick about Shane, the dude is phenomenal. Uh, obviously, huge Alabama fan. He'll tell you all about it. His SEC work is phenomenal, and that's exactly what we're going to dive into. So... Without further ado, Shane, uh, again, welcome. And who are some top prospects that you're watching out of this conference this year? Yeah, that was a heck of an introduction. I hope I hope I live up to the hype, but uh, it's good to <laughs> join you guys. Um, yeah, I'll just get straight into it. Uh, again, I, I am from Alabama. We've all got a fan, you know, or a team that we root for that we're fans of. Um, I happen to be a Bama fan, and, and it's a good year to be one, you know, as far as NFL talent. Uh, several guys I really like. I'll start out with a guy that I like the most, Reggie Ragland, the uh, inside linebacker, off-ball linebacker, however you want to classify. I think he's a really good uh, blend of some Rolando McClain as well as some Dante Hightower, two former Alabama linebackers under Nick Saban. Um, true inside linebacker, I think he's scheme versatile, uh, multiple, 43 or 34, and while he's not as good of an edge rusher in like a sub package situation, Alabama has put him on the edge with his hand in the dirt. So that's something he could do in the NFL on some uh, unique blitz schemes. I think he's probably the safest linebacker in the class. Like you plug him and you play him, you have a starter week one. And uh, I don't know if he'll go top five. C.J. Mosley went 17. So maybe inside linebackers tend to fall a little bit. But he'll probably be a top five, a top eight player at worst overall on my board just based on talent and, and you know, how much I like him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. Montel, I'll go ahead and throw it over to you for real quick, um, kind of pick his brain before I uh, get after him. Oh, okay. It's uh, it's my turn. Is that is that right? Hey, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Well, once again, everybody, this is uh, Shane Alexander. A on G football. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, you know, Shane, I, uh, you know, I, I agree with uh, the year that Alabama is having and the players they have that can succeed at the pro level. Uh, and I agree with what they did with Raglan. I've seen some of his play on the edge, and I've also seen uh, the plays he can make as a linebacker outside the hash. And I agree in the sense that he, he's definitely uh, a scheme versatile uh, potential uh, three four Mike. I guess somewhere in that range. Is that correct? Yeah, very uh, yeah. three four Mike. I think he's even good enough to play, you know, in a forty three. New England's transition more to a, a three linebacker set and high towers held his own. I think he, he has that kind of potential as well. Okay. Okay. Um and and one question I do have for you as we get into the uh, roster here is there's been a lot of love for Alabama's defensive line. Uh I you know I I don't want to you know pick on people. I'll, I'll be disres- I'll be disrespectful, you know, later to Josh about the, the guys that he likes, but specifically you I I got to know the love for Ashawn Robinson. Um you know, I've watched the tape of him. He's powerful. He can flash some good athleticism, but but what else does he give you that that really makes him that first round player he's come along in the last like three to four games a lot more than he did in the beginning of the season he come out you know his freshman year he's a highly talented guy he has really good tape he had a nice sophomore year and you know people always like prospects more when they're younger because there's less holes to pick in their game um you know he came into the season and you're right he didn't have a great first half of the year and 
some of that was his own fault. I think some of that was also Jerron Reed and you know John Allen really, um, you know they they feasted on on offensive lines. But yeah, he does have some inconsistency in his play. But coming on the last couple of weeks, you know there was a play a couple of games ago. He actually hurdled the defensive line, blocked a field goal. Um, he's been, you know blew up some plays mm-hmm. in the Iron Bowl really well. Uh, played well against Mississippi State. I think pe- teams like him or, or scouts like him because he is uh, a guy that can you know, probably be a, a zero to all the way out to three tech. I would really more have him as a one. Um, yep. He's got a really high ceiling. I do think that a guy like Jared Reed or Jonathan Allen's floor is higher. Um, and I was mm-hmm. getting a little bit discouraged with him, you know, until a few weeks back, but then he's really started to flash again. You know, maybe he's just playing, you know, in a weird rhythm those first few weeks. I like him. Um, a, a good bit. Um, I probably like him the most in terms of you know ceiling, is especially if he goes to the the proper system. Um, I might that, like four three Armstrong correct Reed. would be that that proper system. Say what now? I, I'm sorry, four three would be that correct system. Is that is that it? Yeah, I mean, I like him as a I like him as a a one, but I do think he could play, you know, some zero, especially uh, you know, in a team that runs some multiple sets, it, it, it can do some different looks where he could slide over the center or, this, or slide off, you know, depending on how they play. And um, I think he's probably going to be my my second rated defensive tackle behind Kim Dichi. Although I, I actually like him more, it's just hard to hard to argue Kim Dichi's ceiling is, is as high as, as any players in this class. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like John Allen probably the most on this defensive line, to be honest with you. I think he's just ultra complete and can play five tech, you know, all the way in uh, down the line. So I like Sean a lot. He'll probably you know be a top twelve, fifteen player for me, first or second defensive tackle. But I do understand the hesitation, and and I probably like, like I say, Jonathan Allen a little bit more right now. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll hand it back to Josh here. I'm sure he's got a couple questions for you as we move on. Because this, uh, are we, are we going to cover, uh, you know, multiple uh, schools or uh, Josh? I mean, I know SECs are a region. You want to? Well, yeah. I go got ahead, a, shoot him some more questions. I got a couple of them. Um, I mean, we actually kind of talked about it beforehand, so I'm actually kind of excited that he said Jonathan Allen because Jonathan Allen is a guy that I actually do really like. Um, I do agree with Montel more on the side of with Ashawn Robinson. Um, I just haven't seen enough yet to really get enamored and fall in love with him yet. But Jonathan Allen, it, this dude's a freak. Like, I won't be surprised if, you know, come draft time, you know, in mid-April, this dude is being considered to be a top 25 pick. Um, I think he's going to test well, and then everything you see on his tape kind of makes it that notion. So I really like what Shane had to say with that. But there's another guy that, Montel, we have talked about a lot, haven't necessarily agreed with them all the way. And this is Derrick Henry. And I don't know Shane's true side on this yet. I mean, I'm going to find out in a second. Uh, but I love Derrick Henry. I don't love him as much as Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, I think, you know, obviously <laughs> Zeke is on a, a completely different level. But Henry is very good, and he's very efficient. And I think people are kind of taking away from what he can do just because of the fact that he's not this shifty running back that we've seen, you know, year in and year out, you know, that, you know, like last year where we had to kind of watch Todd Gurley and Melvin Gordon, where they both were kind of the same style back in terms, they had breakaway speed and they could be pretty shifty. Uh, Obviously Henry's not that guy. Um, So Shane, who's, uh, or what's your take on Derrick Henry and, how do you think he kind of uh, can mold or evolve heading into the main draft process if he decides to declare? Yeah, I think he's definitely gone. and uh, He's my running back, too, in this class after a clear drop-off, like you say, from Zeke Elliott. And then I think I think the running back class is tiered. I think it's Zeke and then a drop-off and then Henry and then a drop-off to some uh, three or four or five guys. Uh, I like Henry a lot. Um, as a second-round pick, I wouldn't overdraft him. I'm very anti-first-round running back anyway, just because of positional value. But I think you just you're, it's a little bit of an optical illusion with Henry because he doesn't do great behind the line of scrimmage like a traditional running back his size would, and it really isn't many his size, but you know, a, more of a bruising, stereotype running back. He's more of a subtle guy behind the line of scrimmage, uh, and he really thrives once he gets to that second level. So he's, he's sort of uh, – his running mentality is actually – direct opposite than his body type. 
But the great thing about his body type is that in the second level, he can you know make guys bounce off of him. I think if you put him in a system to where um, you have a nice complement to him, then you're going to get a lot out of him. I've seen Legarrette Blunt. Uh, comparisons. I've seen uh, Eddie George comparisons. Somewhere in between there, I think, is Derrick Henry. And, and you look at New England this year, they've got Blunt, who's a subtle back, but a powerful back. Uh, and then they use Deion Lewis out of the backfield in gadget plays. In a, a similar sense, a little bit different, they've got Gio Bernard and Jeremy Hill in Cincinnati. I think if you put him in a situation sort of like that, I think he could really thrive. I think he can take the workload. Um, you know, he's not a top you know, five back in uh, maybe over the last three or four years. But I think in this class, uh, he's clearly the number two back, and I think there's a, a big role for him in the NFL. I'm, I'm a fan of him. I don't think, you know, he's this juggernaut world-beating running back like a lot of maybe average fans see just because they, they follow it casually, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think if you really scout him, you can find a little bit of holes in his game. But I, I think he's definitely mm-hmm. a top 64 pick. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can just jump in here, Josh. Um, yeah. It's your, okay, thanks. Uh, I'm a big fan of him, too. And, you know, earlier in the season, I saw the things because we saw the power, right? And then we started seeing the straight line speed. But what we're starting to see, and this is where you get into the special running back traits, right, is the vision. You know, you can see him kind of get small and get through the hole. And it's not easy to do when you're his size. So, yeah, I'm a Derrick Henry fan, too. I don't, I don't know where to put him. Um, just when the hype was starting about three weeks ago, I said, you know, if you if you spend a third on this guy, I don't think you can lose. Um, right now, if you get a third, if you spend a third on this guy, you might have yourself a steal. Um, but real real quick, I, I got a question from Draft Nation, and that's from the awesome Periscope people we have that that watch the show. Um, they just want to switch gears a little bit, uh, and, and I want to know. Uh, the question reads, this is uh, from NFL Ty. He asked, uh, what are your thoughts on Sean Coleman of Auburn? Uh, I believe he's uh, one of the more underrated tackles in the draft. Shane, have you gotten a look at um, Auburn's uh, tackle in Coleman? Uh, you want to give us maybe some early notes? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Coleman is going to be stereotyped, I think, a lot like Greg Robinson coming out. Um He's shown great development this year, and I agree he's, he's got a bright future. I wish he would go back to school for one more year uh, and get some more reps under his belt. Um, but it's one of those things where if you apply for the draft and you know the, um, the advisory board gives you a, a first-round grade, you may come out. He might even come out if he gets a second-round grade because I think he's going to test extremely well. And for teams that like those athletic tackles, he'll test well. But I still think he's a little bit technically deficient. I wish he would go back, like I say, one more year and just get everything together. He's still very you know, young, but he's got a bright future. I don't know if I'll ever like him as much as I like Greg Robinson. I think, I think Greg Robinson could be a, an all-pro guard um, still, but I do like Sean Colvin quite a bit. He's had an extremely successful year in a year where the offense has been kind of stagnant. It's not really been his fault in a lot of games. I don't think he had a great um, – Last couple of weeks, I did see a couple of guys I follow that are Auburn fans. They're usually quite biased. They were actually even saying Coleman was, you know, looking a little bit uh, deficient in some areas. But high, you know, high ceiling type guy who I think a year from now could be a, a really hot prospect. Um, so yeah, he's got a bright future. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to jump in and, and throw that question in there. Sorry, I didn't warn you beforehand, but if we get questions through Periscope, we try to, you know, uh, oblige the, the the followers and listeners uh, for checking us out. But uh, Josh, you can go, you know, right back. I'm sure you had a few questions, right? Yeah, I got one last one before we let Shane head out. Actually, I lied; I'll have two. Uh, but the first one is another guy that a lot of people aren't necessarily, I don't think, getting a full understanding of yet. And that's Robert Kimdichie. Now, I've talked to some people who think that he's a top five defensive lineman. I've talked to other people who think while he might not be a top five D lineman, he might be top five talent. I personally believe he's a little bit of both. Uh, I think this dude's a clear cut uh, interior defensive tackle in this class. Um, One of the elite talents that we're going to see and have fun watching throughout the process. But, Shane, what do you take away a little bit from uh, Kim Dietschy's game? Yeah, it's funny you asked me about Kim Dietschy because I had a, a friend of mine that's just a casual fan. He was like, hey, man, what do you think about Kim Dietschy? Like, I, I don't know how I feel about him. I feel like it, it doesn't all click with him. 
and I was like, um, have you ever heard of Mario Edwards, who's a former you know, big-time recruit, he plays for the Raiders now? And the guy was like, yeah, kind of. Mm-hmm. I was like, I look at Kim Dietschy like a very, very rich man's version of Mario Edwards, meaning super high-ceiling guy, big-time recruit coming out of high school, makes the pop plays, um, but it doesn't always click. That was a knock on Mario Edwards. He didn't have consistent plays. He didn't stay in shape. His weight fluctuated. And you just kind of wondered, is this guy going to try? Is he going to put it all together? I mean, does he have the drive? You know, he got drafted. You know, I think it was a day three pick. He's had a good rookie year for the Raiders. It seems like he's putting it together. I think Kim Dietschy can, is that way. He doesn't always look like he's in the best of shape. He doesn't always play with the highest motor. But his high motor plays when they are, uh, when everything's clicking, I mean, he's just, he's phenomenal. He, he owned Bama on three or four different series. It's about conditioning. It's about want to. It's about finding a good weight for him because he's got a kind of a weird build. I don't know if any of us really know exactly what his size is right now. But if he wants to be a top five player in this draft, he absolutely can be a top five player in this draft. Um, if, you, if you scout where you try to take everything out of it, just look at it in a vacuum, you'll probably have to put him in the top five, top ten. If you take extenuating circumstances into account, you may put him in that 15 to 20 range because you're a little bit worried about it. But, yeah, he, he is a top talent. We just – we need it to all click. We need him to show us, like, hey, this is who I am down to down, game to game. Awesome. I love it because that's kind of the same way that I'm feeling mm-hmm. a little bit uh, on him in terms that he's just not consistent, kind of like how your friend said, not everything clicks with him in a row when it should. Um, he's a flash play type guy. Of course, one last question. Uh, Montel, I'll be honest with you, I don't even know why I'm going to ask this because we're asking an <laughs> We're asking an Alabama fan who's going to win the SEC championship game, oh, and I know boy. he's going to say Alabama. But, Shane, who's going to win the SEC championship game, and by how much? I wish Florida still had Will Greer at quarterback because, you know, yes. before I'm a Bama fan, I'm a college football fan. I think with Greer, that'd be, it'd be a heck of a matchup. But I don't know if you've watched any Trey on Harris. You know, I hate to just get all over a guy. But he's one of the worst quarterbacks in college football. It just doesn't work with, that, with him. And mm-hmm. I don't know if they'll score. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I, and it's not, you know, it's not a homer thing. It's just they literally can't move the offense. And I really like mm-hmm. McIlwain, so I don't feel good saying it. But I think the Minka Fitzpatrick um, or, uh, or Reggie Raglan takes one back to the house uh, on defense. The defense has been just a bunch of ball hawks this year. So I think there's a defensive touchdown. There might even be a special teams touchdown. I think it could get ugly. I'm going to say 31 to three. Whew. Okay, okay, I can see that. And and just one more uh, yeah. draft nation question here, just to before we get you out of here. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it relates here. It, thanks. And, and it relates here because of who's playing in the game. Uh, we have a question from another follower who asks, uh, "What are your thoughts on the season that Vernon Hargraves had this year?" Yeah, he didn't do anything to hurt himself. You know, if you're if you were high on Hargraves coming in, you're still high on him. If your hesitations on Hargraves are he's a smaller cornerback, then you probably still are a little bit hesitant. He's done nothing to change my stock on him. I think he's one of the top ten players in this class. He, I wish, I wish he was maybe an inch to a half inch taller, and maybe he'll. I'll be interested to see what his true length is, because um, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I am sort of a height supremacist at cornerback. You know, I don't want him too too small, but. <laughs> he's, a, he's a heck of a talent. You know, he's he's a ball hawk. He just seems to always be around, you know, the right spot. He's very technically sound. Um, he's one of the more complete players we've had in college football the last three years, especially in the SEC. So I'm a big VH3 fan, huge fan. Well, thank you, Shane. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you once very again, much. everyone. Yeah, Shane Alexander. Hey guys, it was a, it was a pleasure to be on. If y'all ever want to have me back, y'all just uh, give me a shout. Oh, always. We will definitely have you on. I know Montel would uh, would definitely agree with that as well. <laughs> definitely. Shane, thank you so much for your time. And as always, we'll keep in touch, buddy. And uh, definitely, I think closer to, uh, to January, combine time or something like that, we will definitely be in touch. You guys have a good night. Thank you all. Hey, you as well. Thank you. Well, Montel, hey, we continue to get good ones right there. Again, folks, that was Shane Alexander. Uh, you need to follow him on Twitter if you're a football fan at Alexander the Great. The dude is awesome. He's a very, very good evaluator, and he's also a very good friend of ours as well. Um, but Montel, he was talking about the SEC championship game, which why not continue to talk on it a little bit? Uh, as we all know, we're heading into conference title weekend, 
which is going to be kind of a, a big weekend. This is going to be bigger than what it was last year, all right? We didn't necessarily expect conference championship games to hold as much weight as they do, but, hey, we got what we wanted, I guess. Here we go. You know, you got Alabama and Florida. Now, I do agree with Shane that I wish Will Greer was still at quarterback because it probably would be a completely different game because, as he said, when they were with him at quarterback, they were a very solid football team, and then it just seems everything kind of slid downhill. Alabama is going to run that game. So, unfortunately, and maybe fortunately for Bama fans, they're going to lock themselves in. You know, they'll be the number two, but they could go number one if Clemson loses to North Carolina. Now, this is going to be a big game. I didn't necessarily think North Carolina was that great this year. The epitome of flying under the radar is the truth. They're 11-1. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But the, the biggest thing for me is, Montel, if Clemson loses to North Carolina, the number 10 team in this college football playoff, do they get a chance to go into the Final Four? Does this now make their season relevant? Oh, it's over. It's over. I mean, it's still relevant. Well, actually, it's not. I was about to say it was still relevant because they can play for the conference title, but this is the conference title game. If Clemson loses this, then I think they Clemsoned because they still had a pretty good season, and Clemson has a decent season every year. I mean, this is a great season because, you know, they're undefeated, so this is the most ones they've had in a while. But if you don't have anything to show for it, if you don't have a conference title, if you don't have an, uh, a Final Four playoff appearance, I, I just uh, I don't know how much good you can draw from it. I think the good news is that they're going to, going to return a lot of offensive starters, maybe not too many defensive guys. You know, Josh, I know you love them to death. But um, – I think the key here is you got to think about, you know, the Big Ten teams and how everything's going to be put together. Uh, You know, you're going to have Iowa, Michigan State, and Ohio State sitting there. Uh, I know you feel like you have to bail out the Big 12 and fine, do it, okay? But if Clemson loses, that's – it's done. Um, Not only is the Big 10 uh, title game winner already in, but there may be another Big Ten team in the mix, and I'm hoping it's Ohio State that gets to go. Exactly, Montel. We were actually just – it was funny that you brought this up because I was just getting ready to say it. This Big Ten game is going to be crucial. And I think this, over any other conference championship game, Mm -hmm. is going to actually decide the fate of what the Final Four is going to look like. You're going to have Michigan State and Iowa. And, Montel, Mm -hmm. we talked about this a little bit under the radar last night while we were getting set up. It is hard to imagine just how close of a team these two teams are. They're almost similar. Oh, you know, I'm not going to read the entire thing because you know I read it to you and it was a little loud or a little long. But here we go. Points per game: Iowa, 3.7; Michigan State, 33.2. We'll go to time of possession: 32.13 for Iowa, 33.01 for Michigan State. Red zone trips, 49 to 47. Red zone conversion, 87.8, 85.1. And yet their turnovers, takeaways, and penalties are all the same at 25 takeaways, 11 turnovers, and 61 penalties. The only difference truly that they have is the fact that Iowa's undefeated, Michigan State's 11 and 1. This is going to be a hell of a game. And if Iowa mm-hmm. loses, mm-hmm. If Iowa loses, unfortunately for me, being a Hawk fan, they're out. But Ohio State is licking their chops because if they're the first ones, you know, they're they're on the outside looking in right now. They're number five. Or, excuse me, no, number six. But you're going to have Michigan State automatically be bumped in. Now, you can make an argument for me, and I know you have a great argument for this, so I'm excited to hear this. I would not be upset if it was Michigan State, Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. Yeah, and Josh, you know, I've been saying it forever, and and it needs to be said regarding the, uh, you know, CFB playoff is the fact that you you, you assembled it to put the best four teams in there, right? And you also have to consider – 
the narrative that we got from last year, Josh. I know it's hard to turn back the clock, but if you go a year ago, what happened? Ohio State lost to Virginia Tech. Everyone was like, they don't deserve to go. What a terrible loss, right? And um, that was the narrative. Ohio State would probably be out. And if they didn't completely crush Wisconsin in the title game, then they wouldn't have gotten in. Um, even if it was close, I just don't know that the Buckeyes would have got the benefit of the doubt. But they did, and, and that's how they got in. All right, you look at a school like Alabama, I, I love them to death. Shane, Shane knows I love them to death. But at the very least, and this is just my thought, just wait until the, the after the title game, you know. So if you put Alabama at five now, people will whine and complain and moan. But you know what? You lost to Ole Miss. You lost to Ole Miss. It's not a very good school to lose to. Right now, Ohio State has the best loss in the nation, right? They, they lost to Michigan State um, that, uh, you know, is, is probably, you know, uh, slightly favored, right, for the Big Ten title. So that's one of the best losses in the nation to have if you're a top five or six teams. And then if you go to Oklahoma, I, I, I brought that up too. Oklahoma losing to Texas could have essentially saved Charlie Strong's job. It really did. Oklahoma losing to Texas probably saved Charlie Strong's job. And then Texas continued to lose a little bit. Each week, that Texas loss got a little uglier to me. And everyone was like, well, they lost to Texas then, but this is now. That was, that was five, six weeks ago. So yeah. uh, West Virginia – not West Virginia. Virginia Tech beat Ohio State week four, week five, earlier than that. And it still hung with Ohio State, so now we got a double standard. And even worse, the Big 12 doesn't have a title game. So uh, to me, it's kind of like – Ohio State at least had the chance to crush the people they needed to. I, I don't necessarily think that that Oklahoma State or Alabama are, are more just than Ohio State. Now, I'll give Bama the edge because if Shane is right and they go in there and crush Florida, I mean really take it to them, then sure, put them in. But right now I'd put them in five. My top four right now would be Clemson, uh, Michigan State, Oklahoma State, or no, Clemson, Michigan State, Oklahoma, and Ohio State. And if Bama wants to get in, then they need to crush Florida. If or no, did I put Iowa in there? I'm sorry, Iowa not. would be my. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh. Iowa, not Michigan State. I don't know why I have them in there. Okay, so let's start over. Um, Clemson at one, Iowa at two, Oklahoma at three, Ohio State at four. Okay, if if Michigan State wants to get in the Final Four, all they have to do is beat Iowa. If Alabama wants to get in the Final Four, all they have to do is is crush Florida. So when and you're in, you know, everyone else, you know, their fate is kind of determined. Ohio State doesn't really play in a conference title game, and and and, and Oklahoma is at rest this week. They they they're done, you know, until further notice. So uh, it's just a bit of a double standard, Josh, and it needs to be noticed. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that one. Um, even, I mean, even our top four, for the most part, is right where it needs to be. Um, you know, Ohio State, in my opinion, the only swap would be Ohio, Ohio State would be five or six, and it'd be Michigan State in there. That'd be the only swap that we'd make. Um, but, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Alabama. I think I've been contestant against Alabama the entire time. I think I've also kind of shown my uh, distaste for Oklahoma, not because I'm not a fan of Baker Mayfield and the fact that he can do a pretty good whip and nay nay uh, that decides to go viral <laughs> all over social media. Uh -huh. It's the fact that, you know, we're talking about this kid being a Heisman candidate, but he uh -huh. couldn't even beat he can even beat the worst team in the conference. And I would yeah. consider yeah. I mean, we can talk that Kansas the reason I say Texas is the worst team in the country is because I'm sorry if any of you guys part of Draft Nation, my, mine or Montel's, are mm. fans of Kansas. They're not relevant to me. They're not a Division One school. They no. got beat by two FCS programs this year. Yeah. Granted, those were FCS programs that made the playoffs, but still, they're, they're unrelevant. They went 0-11. And the same thing with Central Florida, which we'll get into here in a second. But I completely agree with it. It'll be interesting to go. Montel, one last tidbit before I throw it over to you to an NGSC Sports update. Everybody knows, if they listened to our show last time, how adamant I was for Keenan Reynolds to make, not hopefully win the Heisman. I'd love the quarterback from the Naval Academy to win the Heisman, but if not, be invited. Well, it just so happens that he has been removed from the fan voting. As of Monday morning at 9 a.m., when I sent my daily vote for Keenan Reynolds, 
By the way, the hashtag, if you want to make it start trending, is hashtag KR for Heisman, please. Removed him. He was removed, but he was leading at 37%. Derrick Henry was the next most voted player by the fans at 24%. And so either ESPN or Nissan let him go. They released him. And it was kind of funny, the shade that, you know, the Naval Academy tweeted it out, uh, you know, Navy Athletics tweeted it out on Twitter saying Keenan Reynolds was leading it, so he was released. Uh, but which is true. I had to say that because I'm adamant for this kid to get invited to New York City, so I'm going to remain. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm warning you now, I'm sending the tweet every day, KR4 mm -hmm. high. I'm going to send it every day. until I, I the see it. And, and I told you, uh, and, and I told you, Josh, and I, I didn't know they'd do it. And we talked about this, right? Because I, I felt like he wouldn't win, but I wasn't going to argue that he was worth inviting, you know, to the ceremony. There's always a guy who's invited that doesn't quite get the number of first round votes as his peers. But uh, I did tell you it was a perplexing situation, right? Because he was a quarterback, but doesn't have proficient passing numbers, but he does have proficient running numbers, and he's been a winner. So. Um, I thought on those merits he'd get to go, but right now that is, well, that's preemptively blackballing uh, triple option quarterbacks from Heisman contention. And it's now, pretty that's, distasteful. That's, that's what it is. Now, yeah, I mean, that's, I didn't, I didn't know they'd be so bold, Josh. Uh, I have a question from Draft Nation, real quick, Montel, and then I'll toss it to you. Why do I think he was taken off? It's simple, because he played at the Naval Academy, and he was a quarterback but didn't play quarterback. I will agree with Montel. His passing stats weren't the greatest. While he didn't have a ton of interceptions, or fumbles for that matter, his yards weren't what people would expect a quarterback to be. Either way, the fact that the fans were voting that he was 37% and was leading all of the fan votes is shocking to me that Nissan or ESPN, whoever has the one to control that, because it's not the Heisman mm -hmm. Committee, because it was a fan vote, removed him from the poll. Whoever did that is distasteful, it's dishonest, and it goes back to what I said in the very beginning about the award is not going to the best player in the country. It's going for notoriety. They want to see a guy from a Power 5 school win the Heisman. I mean, yeah. so I don't yeah. want, yeah, you know, it's just, it's a distasteful mm -hmm. situation, and I'm ashamed that either Nissan or ESPN has let it go 12 and a half hours now and hasn't fixed it because I checked it at 6.30 before we got on uh, into the studio, and he's still removed. So it's pretty distasteful by the fact that ESPN and Nissan would remove this kid after – you know, easily thousands of fans across the country have voted for this kid because they think that he deserves the right. Um, but we could go on a tangent on this all day because I was extremely mm -hmm. heated about it when I saw it. So, again, Draft Nation, if you agree with me and Montel's take, the Twitter handle hashtag that we're going to make trending will be hashtag KR4Heisman, four as in the letter four. So, but, uh, oh, and now I'm being, Montel, I'll throw it over to you because Draft Nation is asking me mm -hmm. uh, where I got mm -hmm. my cool sweatshirt. Um, I got it at Cabela's. <laughs> I got it at Cabela's. Um, okay. So, Montel, I'll go ahead and throw it over to you uh, for a quick NGSC Sports update. Of course. Uh, thanks, Josh. I'm Montel Hardy, and this is an NGSC Sports News Break. Just a reminder, you can listen in to all our awesome shows at NGSCSports.com. Just go to the show pages and click on NGSC Draft Central homepage. In the news now, Mark Rick will be Miami's next head coach. According to um, sources from ESPN.com's Brett McMurphy and Mark Schlaback on Wednesday. News of the hiring was reported earlier by canesinsight.com. Georgia announced Sunday that Rick would not return as its football coach. Rick uh, coached there for 15 years and will lead the Bulldogs into their bowl game following a 9-3 and finish to the regular season. 
In other news, Michigan defensive coordinator DJ, or I'm sorry, Michigan, yeah, Michigan Wolverines defensive coordinator DJ Durkin was named new head coach of the Maryland Terrapins early Wednesday morning. Durkin was an attractive candidate to Maryland, a source said, because of his fire, passion, recruiting prowess, and lineage to Urban Meyer and Jim Harbaugh. Durkin's offensive plans would likely fit along the lines of Ohio State's spread power attack, as Maryland's leadership has made it clear offensive improvement was paramount. Be sure to check out NGSE's hottest stories uh, in the news now. I have a Super Bowl rematch by Seattle, essentially a prediction. Both the Patriots and in the Super Bowl again. Obviously, a lot has changed since their uh, matchup uh, nearly 12 years ago. Another uh, article on the website now is Beating Vegas Entry 12. This is written by NGSC's own G. Stelio. Uh, this one will cover North Carolina and Clemson uh, and a few other title games, including Michigan State and Iowa, and of course, Florida and Alabama. Right now, G has Alabama plus 17, or I'm sorry, Florida plus 17 versus Alabama in the SEC title game. Remember, everyone, you can check out these articles and so many more on our homepage at NGSCSports.com. Once again, you're listening to the NGSC Weekly Flagship Program on NGSC Sports Radio. Available on iHeart, Spreaker, and iTunes. From Draft Central, this is Montel Hardy. Back to you, Josh. Hey, thank you, Montel. I appreciate it, brother. Um, Man, dude, Draft Nation is really loving the fact that I got this really cool, like, thermal hunting sweater. They've been asking me questions about it all day. Um, it's not a jacket, but it's not a sweatshirt. It's a low, It's like a pullover, and it's super comfy. So while Draft Nation continues to obviously uh, loathe my fashion sense, let's get into talking about these head coaching vacancies. Um, you obviously brought up uh, Durkin to Maryland. I'm not going to lie to you. I was really hoping that Mark Rick would accept the job. I think he would have been the perfect guy. We talked about it a little bit last night again uh, in our pre-show meeting that can you imagine Mark Rick, Jim Harbaugh, Urban Meyer, D'Antonio, Pat Fitzgerald, Kirk Ferentz, all in the same conference? I mean, we saw just yeah. what happened. I mean, we saw what happened this year just adding Jim Harbaugh. Yep. You know, they made Michigan relevant again. I yep. mean, I, I, would, I would assume that he would do the exact same thing at Maryland had Rick got the job. Uh, but nonetheless, it is going to be interesting to see just where this Maryland program goes and who knows just how many of those Urban Meyer or even Jim Harbaugh type guys that he brings with him. Uh, but obviously, Montel, the hottest news of the day is the fact that the U may have found their guy finally, as Mark as it's been reported uh, later this evening that Mark Rick has accepted the coaching job there to become the new head coach for the University of Miami Hurricanes. I'm not going to lie to you; um, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily like the hire. Um, I think it's a great hire for Miami and Miami fans, um, but for Mark Richt. To be honest, man, I don't know what what stirred him away from from Maryland and the opportunity to recruit in the Big Ten, especially in that area. You know, recruiting that Washington D.C. area, DMV, in that Landover area. Mm-hmm. I, I know it's a lot different than recruiting in Miami, but you look at what Maryland has from a talent perspective already set in stone, and we've seen a little bit of the struggles defensively that Miami has. And this guy's supposed to be somewhat of a, you know, a big hand in defense. I mean, obviously it didn't work with Pruitt running mm-hmm. that Georgia defense, mm-hmm. but, you know, that's obviously a different discussion for another day. But what was about this in Miami job, in your opinion, that he took it for? Well, it's real simple. I think immediately upon being fired, and when you think about why he was fired, right, because he couldn't beat Saban because he couldn't win the national title, those are the pressures that come with being an SEC coach. So when you think about it, he's already out of the SEC, which means he probably doesn't want Mizzou. South Carolina isn't going to happen. Um, not that he wouldn't be offered, but maybe he just doesn't want to do it. He wants job security. He doesn't want to have to look over his shoulder at Saban. So, you know, you, you think about SEC is out. Um, and then you look north to the Big Ten. Uh, 
I think, you know, there are some jobs that in a different world could have been open that might have been a little bit more appealing. Um, but when you look at Maryland, um, they've had a very tragic two years in the Big Ten. Um, last year was a lot better than this year. This year it seems like the wheels have fallen off in some respects. I think as a coach uh, as well-respected as him, as far along as he is, the type of rebuilding and retooling to get them just to be bowl eligible on a regular basis, it might be something he just doesn't want to put effort towards. Miami is struggling to compete in the ACC, but at least they're a, you know a, a seven and five, six and six, the four. Yeah. And and so I think when you're an elite coaching candidate, and that's what that's what Mark Rick is, you want to go to a team that's maybe the furthest along and also maybe the most prestigious. And I think Miami just gave him the best of both worlds. Um, I think he's going to have a separate set of struggles there. But like I said before, I do think him being there is good for Brad Kaya because he's probably going to bring in a similar pro-style offensive guy. Because that's what I was worried about, Josh, is that – it, you know, if you change systems now, Brad Kaya to me is going to be the best, the best prospect we've seen since Andrew Luck. I don't want to see him in a different system. Not that it would, you know, he'd be bad at it because I think he'd succeed in any system. But, you know, their terminology, um, being on the same page, you know, and, and all those things that come with it. So I like Kaya in the same system. I think that's what Rick will institute. And I think, I think Miami will be okay. You know, I think 9-3, and three, if you can do that with Miami, they'll love it. Uh, it's sad to it used to be the perfect season, but uh, they're content with that. And with the of FSU, I think this is how you do it. Yeah, Montel, you know, I completely agree with you with that, man. You know, you said probably, now that I actually sat back and thought about it, that's probably the biggest key was the fact that Kaya is going to be there at quarterback. He's going to be a three-year mm-hmm. starter. He's mm-hmm. going to have a, a a good running game. He's going to mm-hmm. have uh, with a uh, I can't think of his first name, but Yearden or Yeadon, number two. Yeah. You know, you'll have yeah. Yeadon there. Uh, you're going to have some talent on the edges because it's I mean it's the University of Miami. They find a way to recruit. Oh, matter of fact, I believe it's Michael Irvin Jr.'s son is committed there as five star recruit tight end. Um, hard to believe Irvin's son is a is a fatty, but kind of is. Um, yeah. He's, he's probably going to be a, an athletic fatty. Watch out. He he will be. You know, I have seen a little bit of him, and I was like, oh, damn, like this dude can move. But they're going to have him, and they're also going to have Sam Bruce, which is Isaac Bruce's nephew. Uh, he also signed at the University of Miami. So that's two big five-star recruits already right there for that offense and for Brad Kaya. That obviously, in my opinion, was the go-to. I mean, you look at Maryland, they couldn't even get Stephon Diggs as a little brother. Um, he was originally committed there. They didn't have a quarterback. He took a visit to Alabama. And then now next year you're going to see Trayvon Diggs and Stacey Col- or uh, Calvin Ridley, excuse me. I was thinking, I don't know why, uh, Stacey Coley. Uh, Calvin Ridley mm-hmm. sharing the receiver position in Tuscaloosa, uh, which is going to be filthy. Um, so the University of Miami is, is, is an interesting one. Um, we talked about Scott Frost a little bit. I'll be honest with you. I'm surprised he took the Central Florida job, or anybody took the Central Florida job for that matter. Uh, their program is – it's amazing what happens when you lose a Blake Bortles. And I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not a huge Blake Bortles guy. I didn't like him coming out. He was my third-best quarterback. And – Mm-hmm. Going into the draft, while he was my third best quarterback, I thought Derek Carr was going to be drafted over him. So I didn't like Bortles mm-hmm. at all. But <laughs> since they've lost Blake Bortles, they have not been a competitive football program. They've only won two games in those two years. I mean, hopefully, yeah. with what Scott Frost has to do with that Oregon offense, you know he's going to bring that playbook down there with him. Uh, an offense that. I mean, obviously this year you could see that it took Vernon Adams to get a little bit acclimated to that playbook. He had that really hot game against Eastern Washington and then flamed out against Utah and Michigan State, and now he's been absolutely killing it for the last three weeks, which is one of the big reasons why that Oregon not only beat Stanford as an upset, 
but it got them back into the top 25, and they're sitting at number 15 right now. Uh, but for you, Montel, do you think Scott Frost taking that job was a you know was was a good call for the school? Well, the school, if they can get Scott Frost, they take him. Um, I think he'd be one of the more talented coaches they had there in a while. Um, radically different, but uh, good different. Uh, obviously, his system's different. Uh, he comes from, uh, you know, Oregon, just as you said, up-tempo type of scheme. It's a team that's always ran spread, but not quite the high-tempo, run-intensive, you know, real spread, you know. So um, I think making uh, Scott Frost the, the head coach of UCF is a great move if you're an AD for UCF. Um, but if you're Frost, I don't know why you don't just hang back and look at maybe a better job in a bigger conference. Frankly, I think Maryland's a better job than UCF right now. I think uh, if you wanted to, uh, a young, talented offensive mind like that might get, you know, South Carolina's, you know, even if they use him as leverage, he could get an interview with South Carolina. That would do some things. Uh, I also think you look uh, – let me see. There's another job, uh, you know, the Rutgers job. So there's there's a few other jobs for him that I think would be more special and more advantageous. But I get where he's coming from. I think Frost is a good young coach, and he just wants to get his feet out there, get you know, get his feet wet at head coaching. I think, I mean, I hate to say it, UCF is going to be a stepping stone to him, but I think it is. I think he's, if he's successful, I don't think he'll be there longer than three years. And then I think he'll go himself, go out and get the job he can really, he really, you know, wants or desires. Yeah, you know, that's the thing with me is I was actually surprised that he pulled the trigger on it. You know, you look at some of these coaches that have kind of been sitting and waiting for that head job to open up. You know, uh, I mean, you look at David Shaw, he kind of walked into the the fact that Harbaugh left for the NFL and he was able to walk into that Stanford job. But you even look at, uh, who is it, is it Todd, Todd Hermans, you know, at, at Houston, you know, was the quarterback's coach and uh, offensive coordinator at Ohio State since Urban Meyer got there. Look at what he did his first year in Houston. They're a top 25 team. I believe they're number 20 in the country right now. They have a quarterback who's a freak, and I think he's only a sophomore, that Charlie Ward Jr. Um, you know, he's damn good, impressive. So that's the biggest thing is that, you know, they'll be able to have a little bit bigger picking. This year didn't necessarily have those marquee jobs that we expect to open up at a daily basis, you know, or I should say a yearly basis for that matter, I, I would believe that the you know the hottest jobs on the market right, right now would have been probably Virginia, just because it's a Power 5 conference, it's ACC school, uh, possibly that Maryland job, depending on, again, what type of offense do they want to run with that system with the players that they have in there, and then uh, that South Carolina job. SEC, it's a premier school. You'll be able to get a lot of talent there. Other than that, the other jobs across the country I didn't think were true marquee jobs. Exactly. Um, and I think there's going to be, a, you know, a ton of marquee jobs out here for these coaches. You know, Josh, I already told you how much I love Dino Babers. I think he's going to be a guy who um, – he might get a look from Syracuse now um, since uh, the UCF thing didn't work out. But you, you discussed Maryland earlier. I really think Babers to Maryland would be a good move. And, uh, you know, I want to see it. I want to see this guy get promoted and, and get himself into a, a, a little bit more of a feistier conference. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I completely agree. Um, it, of course, we also have to wait, too, because I, I do have a feeling that after bowl season, we are probably going to see some jobs open up that, I mean, weren't open two weeks ago. Um, so I do agree with you. I think I think Frost should have, you know, kind of, you know, held himself in check a little bit there. But, but hey, what do you do? You know, the only thing we can say is, you know what, they had a hell of an offense in Oregon. Being able to recruit in Florida is just like being able to recruit in Texas. Uh, you can always tell schools, well, I'm not going to go to this D1 school. I'll just go to this D1 school instead of going to a D2 school. Uh, so hopefully they'll be able to find the premier talent that they need in order to succeed in that conference. But I will say it is going to be a building block in that program for a while to come. I don't expect them to win a whole lot of games over the next two to three years. But transitioning to probably – I know this is something that we've been talking about lately. It's been getting hotter uh, as a topic within the draft community, and that's the Senior Bowl. 
Uh, hard to believe that we're talking about the Senior Bowl in December and the fact that it's already becoming a hot commodity. Well, probably because this year they're getting more noticeable talent in terms of the big-name seniors to commit to this game than they have in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you look at Noah Spence, a former Ohio State Buckeye. He's a fourth-year junior. He got invited and accepted his invite. That's going to be fun to watch and see how he matches up with some of these left tackles, uh, some of these right tackles, uh, see just how he can pass rush um, since he's kind of been out of the true Power 5 game, uh, well, for a year now. Um, But who else, Montel, on your radar has been offered that you really like or maybe a guy out there who you think should be offered and potentially maybe will get that offer later in the road? Uh, you know, and that's a, that's a great uh, question. Um, you know, as we look right now as to, you know, some of these players that are going to be on there, uh, I think Paxton Lynch, um, you know, talked about him, you know, all the time. And uh, I, I'm excited about what he can do because we might see, and I don't know if we've seen this in a while, two senior quarterbacks square off in, in Connor Cook and uh, Paxton Lynch uh, right there uh, at the game. So, or not at the game, but obviously in the practices leading up to the game, this might be the battle for, to see who can go in the first round, even though, like I've said, I don't know if Cook is a first rounder, but it, you know, it deserves to be said. Um, but right now, I, I think the way it sits is that's a guy I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, I'm hoping, uh, and we don't know this yet, but I'm hoping to see hopefully, you know, Car- Connor, uh, not Connor, uh, Carson, uh, Wentz may be healthy, Maybe he can get out there and do some things. Um, but, uh, yeah, those are some guys I guess I'm looking at early on. Yeah, uh, I really like the Connor Shaw. Um, I really like Connor Shaw. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. I think he's the one, if anybody, he needs to accept this right away. Um, I think he's yeah. the one that can benefit the most from it to be invited for the game. Um the other guy that I really like would be Sean Oakman. I think this is going to be a huge weekend for him, or I should say huge week for that matter. Um, Montel, we've been on this dude for a good minute, and people are now starting to finally realize that, number one, I'm going to give us a little bit of credit here, we're not dumb. Yeah. All right? We, we, saw, we saw that Sean Oakman could play ball. We knew that maybe his technique was a little raw here and there. But we saw something, and people are mm. now finally, you know, coming out of the woodworks saying, oh, man, whew, draft Twitter was wrong about this guy. We need yeah. to give him a yeah. look. And it's like, dude, it's like about time you all started figuring out that this guy can play football. You are not built to be 6'9", 270 pounds, or maybe 280 pounds, and not be as powerful and as explosive he is off the line of scrimmage. All right. Now, Absolutely. I understand the technique being there a little bit, but it's about time. That was probably one of the biggest things that bothered me. So now with this weekend, I'm telling you right now, if he absolutely kills it at the Senior Bowl, kind of like how Grady Jarrett did last year, people are going to be calling for this guy to be a top 15 pick. And in my opinion, yep. he will be drafted in the top 15, not because of the fact that he – had the talent all year round, but it's going to be people are going to be writing their mock drafts, mocking them in the top 15 because they saw him kill the combine and they call him killed the senior bowl. Now, yeah. going off of that, obviously that was a little bit of a rant, but going off of that, if he does kill it, that is going to completely destroy what people have been projecting to be this type of, you know, this defensive edge class this year. It's going to shake up those rankings. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of mm-hmm. guys right now that, don't have him even in the top five. And it's like, have you really watched his tape yet? But uh, I'll, I'll let you go. Okay, you know, I'll just go be over here, you know, with my boy Montel sipping some tea. But we're going to find out just how good and just how talented this kid is. And remember, nobody kind of nobody for, kind of remembers this, but they do get a little bit of time before mm-hmm. the Senior Bowl rolls around. They will yep. have about a month of, yep. you know, being able to kind of prepare before the Senior Bowl shows up, that week of the Senior Bowl shows up. If yep. I'm Sean Oakman, I am out there every day working with Andrew Billings, working with uh, Drago, 
getting my mm-hmm. technique fundamentally sound. That way, by the time I get to the Senior Bowl in Mobile, I'm ready to just snap necks and cash checks. And if he's able to do that, this dude's going to be phenomenal in terms of just the type of fire he's going to create for draft season. I think that's what I'm excited exactly. about the most. Uh, so I, I think everybody knows mm-hmm. now in terms of draft nation, I think everybody now knows just who I'm excited about for the senior bowl. Uh, yeah. Can I really, just drop it, it, one it really more is name Sean out there? Yeah, I know. I agree on the Sean Oakman note. I think once he gets out there having the body he has and people just look at this six, eight, six, seven being, uh, I think it's going to be, I mean, that, that he'll move up around <laughs> like just by looking at him. Um, and he's going to be motivated and he's, Guy who one is with power and something like he can overwhelm his assignment. So I'll call it. There'll be even times when they do their one one I don't know which tackle it's gonna be. Sean Oakman is going to put this man on his back. He's gonna blow someone up at camp. Just do it once and, and you can you know, you can call it. He'll probably go in the first, but Combine is going to be his big show. But I just, you know, now that I bring out the roster, I absolutely love the fact that Joe Sobert's going. I think people are going to know he's more than just a guy after this. I am so sick of hearing it. In a year where we don't have very good edge rushes, defensive ends, outside linebackers that can play in three-four schemes, you better love Joe Sobert. You better love to. You better love this guy because he's, he's really about as, as much as you're going to get outside of Georgia. And one final note, I really think that <clears throat> among the guys who accepted it, Look for Jason Spriggs out of Indiana. Very good offensive tackle, and this is a very deep class. Yeah, that kid, he's he's pretty talented. Uh, I know that uh, Rick Meyer, Nick Meyer, and Nate Meyer, and that Iowa front four had their hands full when Iowa played Indiana this year. Um, he's a true talent. Um, real quick, uh, before we decide to. In- uh, get ready to cut the show on you guys this evening. We're going to cut the cord on you all a little short. Uh, one name that I want everybody who is a part of Draft Nation to keep an eye out for, all right, is Yannick Ngakwe, defensive end from Maryland. Oof, well, t- time out. Josh, Josh just killed the pronunciation there. Can, can, can we hear that again? Can you do it again? Yannick Ngakwe. Oh, all right, all right. You can continue. <laughs> the only reason, and I'll be honest, the only reason why I know how to pronounce it so well is because I was listening to Pam Ward say it 20 times <laughs> when I was watching the Penn State game from 2014. I was able, he, he was so dominant in that game against the run and consistently hitting Hackenberg that the name will stick into your head. It's kind of like uh, last year where people – uh, didn't necessarily want to talk about him because they couldn't pronounce his name, but oh, Ma Boy Odigi Zua is it's kind of the same type oh, of player. You're going to yeah. learn how to pronounce his name because he's that dominant on film. And so I'm telling you guys, Yannick Ngakwe, he's a junior defensive end from Maryland. He wears number seven. He's a stand up guy. You could also move him out into a three technique. If you guys want to get an early jump on him, because there's no Maryland tape out there as of yet in terms of draftbreakdown.com, go and watch him play 2014 against Iowa and be lined up against Brandon Scherf. Um, now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, and that was the game that made me panic about Brandon Scherf. Because I was watching the game, I was watching the game grading Scherf, Josh. And, and, and after that game, I realized how good he was. Yeah, and well, and here's the thing, you know, Scherf will get a little bit of what he needs in that game. You'll see everything that everybody saw in him last year, but there are going to be about six or seven snaps that he's lined up against Scherf where it's like, whoa, dude, that was pretty cool. And there's also one, it's a run blitz, he hits it perfectly, and it's one of those run blitzes where you're, you know, kind of just Drew Stanton it, on the sidelines when you're watching it on film, you're like, oh, wow, he killed it. So I'm telling you guys right now, keep him in the back of your head. If he decides to declare, he's going to be fun to watch. Another quick note on him before we do turn it over is that him and Carl Nassib, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, Carl Nassib, uh, they're leading the Big Ten in sacks right now with 15 and 13 and a half, or I believe 14 and a half. So he's going to be fun to watch. All right. 
But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, it's about that time that we say I do. Uh, we want to thank you guys very much for taking time out of your evening to check us out here at Draft Nation and the Draft Central Podcast. As always, I am your host, Joshua Zimmer. For Mr. Montel Hardy, again, thank you very much for taking time out of your night to come talk some football and educate everybody a part of Draft Nation as to what we learned. And again, a big thanks to Shane Alexander from A1G Football for taking the time even with the night that he had his podcast, to come talk to us about some of his top SEC prospects. It was truly the greatest. Montel, any parting words, my friend? Uh, of course. Uh, you know, as always, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks for Shane for coming on the show. And uh, thanks to you, Josh. I think this is this was a you know, hell of a show we just did, you know. So <laughs> uh, everyone tune in next week. Can't wait to do it again. Hey, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, You guys have yourselves a good rest of your week.